That's what works too. Okay. It says it's recording. Well, hello, Aldersgate family. My name is Pastor Paul, and welcome to the next Pastor Corner. I it is my it is my deep privilege to introduce <laughs> one of my uh, brother clergymen, uh, Jimmy Calvert. He was, hello, everyone. Yeah, he was with me in seminary, and uh, we got to know each other pretty well, and so we've. We've uh, kicked the ball around quite a bit over the years, and uh, so he's he's a guy that I will regularly uh, prep sermons with, and so we'll just get together and talk through text and see how we're going to preach a certain text, and uh, very often we disagree, and uh, this week was one of those disagreements. So you'll remember on Sunday we did Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus. And I compared uh, Zacchaeus to a mob boss, to Tony Soprano in a sycamore tree. And uh, that is one interpretation. It turns out in this particular story, there are two, at least two major different branches of interpretation. And I think Jimmy took exactly the other one, the one- I the, took the other one. Yeah, the opposite one from the one I took. And so I wanted to bring Jimmy on and just uh, let him talk about that a little bit, and then we'll argue about it playfully for a little bit, and that'll be it. So, so Jimmy, what, uh, what was your interpretation of Zacchaeus? Is he Tony Soprano? In the I would say no. I would okay. say he was a, a misunderstood wealthy tax collector. Uh, yeah, so I took that, I took that track. Um, I saw some similarities between the two stories that the blind man who was healed just outside Jericho and then Zacchaeus who was inside Jericho. Uh, both of them were rejected by the crowd and I felt both of them were restored to their community and vindicated by Jesus. Um, so the way that I presented it to my congregation the blind man would have been seen as a sinner uh, because of his circumstances. So the fact that he's blind and destitute, kind of a double whammy, he must have really sinned hard. And so when he cries out for mercy, the crowd is like, you know, Jesus doesn't really have time for all that. You, you made your bed, you got to lay in it. But Jesus stops and calls him over and asks him, you know, one of these uh, key moments in scripture, what do you want me to do for you? Um, and so he is restored to health. He's restored to community and follows Jesus then with the crowd. And so then they encounter Zacchaeus, the second person, and his situation is the complete opposite. He is not uh, disabled. He is not poor. Uh, he is so able that he can climb trees uh, and he is very, very wealthy. But both men were very eager to see Jesus. That's a key, key point there, I think. And mm -hmm. both of them rejected by the crowd. The crowd grumbled because Jesus is hanging out with this guy. And so I think that they were lumping all tax collectors together. All tax collectors work for the Romans. They're cheaters. They're liars. They take more. They steal from us. Um, and I think we find out that that's not necessarily true of Zacchaeus. So you may, I don't know if you talk to your congregation about the, the word will uh, the NRSV says, you know, when yeah. he comes to repentance, he says, I will, right. uh, you know, I give yep. half my possessions to the poor. And No, I actually skipped over that. So why don't you explain that part? Because I think that is the important part. Yeah. So this kind of where the interpretations start to uh, split there. Um, the NRSV and several translations, when Zacchaeus uh, is, is kind of confronted by Jesus or the kindness of Jesus, he either says, uh, I will give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone, I will give them up to four times the amount back in repayment. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is the word will is not there. He's speaking in present tense. Right. Uh, and so the way that some translators take that is he is saying this change begins now, here and now. I give half my possessions to the poor mm -hmm. and I pay back four times the amount starting right now. Mm -hmm. So they insert the word will there. But the other way you could take that is that this has always been his practice. Mm -hmm. So I read from the CEB yesterday 
uh, which words it this way. He says, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. To which Jesus replies, salvation has now come to this man because he's been vindicated. He too, like the blind man, has been restored to community. He is a righteous, wealthy tax collector. He's been living rightly and y'all prejudged him wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I took that, of course, for my congregation, we took that into all the groups of people that we prejudge and kind of lump together mm -hmm. and make assumptions about them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we can talk all day uh, about that. So, yeah, I think it, I think it went, it went over well, but you're right. There are we, people don't agree mm -hmm. on how it should be read. Yeah, and I think this is one of those fascinating uh, places in scripture where, you know, scholars disagree, you know, is it in the present tense or not? So it really comes down to the question, had, was Zacchaeus giving half of his stuff to the poor before Jesus showed up? That's really the question. And it all comes down to how you translate these Greek, this, this Greek, right? Mm -hmm. Um and then the implications of that are really interesting because, uh, you know, like you say, I, I think there's definitely a way to go where it, this is really more a story about the crowds and less to do with Zacchaeus himself. Yeah. Other than the point that you really made that, that I think is very strong is you're talking about restoration, you know, mm -hmm. and we talk about what is salvation, you know, it really definitely is a reconciliation, a restoration. It's not just going to heaven when you die. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so one thing I will say is in both of our interpretations that I was thinking about this last night, in both of our interpretations, that doesn't change, right? If Zacchaeus is already living righteously or not, in any case, either way, Jesus is bringing restoration. Jesus mm -hmm. is bringing reconciliation and relationship uh, where it wasn't before mm -hmm. so I, I think there now that I was thinking about it more that you could almost make a sermon you know you could preach it both ways mm -hmm. and then say but what is still the same and what is still the same is Jesus is the source of salvation yeah and, and this is what salvation means for Zacchaeus is he is restored to his community he is elevated up where never you know Otherwise, he would be prejudged forever. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a fascinating part to me, is even though you can take very different lines uh, and very different arguments and interpretations, you end up in the same place, which is mm -hmm. Jesus' salvation. But uh, all right, what do you think? Give me, let's kick it around a little bit more. Well, so I, I, I really felt like... Um, you know, up, up until now in, in Lent, Jesus has been giving us parables, kind of trying to get us to change our minds about how we think about God and about our neighbor. And he's doing that through awesome parables. But then when we get into Jericho, he switches to actually modeling. Rather than telling a story, he's actually living it out mm -hmm. by stopping for, for these two men. Mm -hmm. And so he's modeling. I, you're right. He's bringing salvation in some form or sense to both the blind man and Zacchaeus, but he is still also modeling for the crowd. I think even though they're following Jesus along the way to Jerusalem, they too need a change of heart and mind about yeah. all types of things, you know? So, so I kind of present it as, you know, this salvation it's happening on this individual basis, but it's also something geared toward the crowd. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that, I mean, the crowd is a major player here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and throughout Luke, you see that the whole time is the, Luke, the crowd is always there. And many times Jesus is teaching the crowd, even though he's talking to a particular person. Or, yeah. or even if he's, you know, telling a parable to the Pharisees, the crowd is never far away. Yeah. And, and one of the and getting into Palm Sunday now, I think it's kind of interesting because now we see a couple of different crowds in play, right? We see the crowded disciples at Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking about this. I mean, do they get it? 
looking ahead a little bit, do you think the crowd at Palm Sunday gets it? Because now they're rejoicing. Now they're saying, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Right. Right. I mean, my first thought is that, no, they thought maybe this was like some weird display, but he's really going to take up the throne. Like he's going to start the rebellion anytime, you know, we don't know why he's riding in on a donkey, but we think this is the guy, you know, he's going to finally free us from these Romans. Mm -hmm. um, probably not getting yeah. the display itself. And that would be an interesting, an, an interesting sermon or an interesting study is does the crowd ever get it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Do they ever get it right? I mean, yeah. Uh, and of course, Luke is writing to an audience who has already heard the whole story. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So even, even uh, last week with uh, the rich man and Lazarus, um, Abraham saying to Lazarus, even if someone rises from the dead, they're still not going to believe. This is written to an audience who knows Jesus is said to have rose from the dead. So yeah. are you going to be like Lazarus or are you going to be one who gets it? You know, so I think that's something we have to keep in mind, too. Mm -hmm. um, the audience that he's writing to, what kind of relationship did they have with tax collectors like Zacchaeus? Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship did they have with blind beggars mm -hmm. sitting at the roadside and, and, and rich and rich people, too? I, I think rich, that's rich really, people. That's a really interesting question is it was Luke's audience rich because <laughs> they do very badly. And this is one thing that stuck out to me is up until now, there is not a good example of, of wealth in Luke. Mm. But Zacchaeus is kind of the counter example to that. You know, here we do have a rich person who finds salvation, right? We have yeah. a rich person, you know, the camel uh, made it through the eye of the needle. Praise God, you know. So it's a very yeah. interesting the placement is also very interesting as the story right before the entry into Jerusalem, right? It's the last story before Holy Week. And that, that's an interesting, I think there's something there too that you could probably play around with. And don't forget, Luke did give us an example of good tax collectors in the third chapter. Uh, well, you mean, what do you mean? That he was eating with so, them? No, so John the Baptist is baptizing, and oh. all kinds of folks are coming saying, what do we need to do yeah. to be right with God? And one of those groups is tax collectors. Right. What do we need to do, John? And John says, make sure you don't collect more than you're supposed to. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. I mean, how good were they, right? You know, um, <laughs> it is definitely surprising. It would have been surprising to Luke's audience that tax collectors were shown in any good light, I think. Yeah. So he's like, man, even the tax collectors and the soldiers, can you believe it? Even those guys were coming to John the Baptist. Yeah. I think that's sort of the theme there, but. Of course, we will get in Luke 23, we will get Joseph of Arimathea, mm -hmm. a wealthy man who donates uh, a tomb mm -hmm. for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Very so we do have we do have some of those examples in Luke. Yeah, yeah. towards the end, though. I, uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, yeah. it's interesting that there is a little bit of a shift there. And, and Joseph of Arimathea is a is a really interesting story, and I'm looking forward to doing that one. Yeah, in the weeks too, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know how much did he get? That, that's another question in my mind: is how, did did he really understand or not, or yeah. when did he? So yeah, I mean, who of us totally understands? Well, that's true. <laughs> that, I mean, which is a good point, right? And, and right. It, you could always do that with this story too, with the Zakia story: is where are you in the story, right? Yeah. Uh, how many of us are in the crowd, you know, prejudging this this idiot in the tree, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In the tree. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you and I took very, very different lines yeah. um, on the same story. And, yeah. uh, and I think this is a great example of how fun Bible study can be and how you can really yeah you can, for sure really fascinating yeah i uh do you listen to the bible worm podcast no so that's the one with uh a christian pastor and a 
Jewish rabbi, a, oh. a guy, guy pastor and a female rabbi, and they get together and discuss from both viewpoints. One of the things that, that he said in that podcast that really struck me, and I said it in my sermon yesterday, is that if, if this interpretation is right, that he was actually living rightly, he has been prejudged by preachers for 2,000 years <laughs> or for a long time. The traditional way of reading it, yeah. we too are guilty of prejudging Zacchaeus and lumping him in with all the other tax collectors. And, it's, and it really stuck out to me that maybe I had been reading this story wrong all these years, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, maybe. And, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe yes, maybe no. All comes down to that one little Greek verb. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, it's been a pleasure. Um, well, thank, thank you, you for so inviting much. me. Yeah. Um, guys, I think this won't be the last time that you see Jimmy. Um, he is a delight and a, a very uh, dear friend of mine, but also a wonderful Bible scholar. So we're going to have him back from time to time. I'd like to have you come down and preach sometime, buddy. I would, would love to. Uh, I would. So Aldersgate family, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll close it off here, but thank you so much for tuning in to uh, this yeah. of uh, Pastor Corner. And we'll and see. You thank soon. you, Paul. Yep. God see bless you, you. All right. God bless you. Be good, man. Bye bye.